Joel part 5 we're in Joel 2 verse 15 Joel 2 verse 15 and I may break this I don't know we'll see how fast we get through it I may break this and this may be a short night because there's a deep section coming <laughs> Joel 2 verse 15 blow the trumpet in Zion sanctify a fast call a solemn assembly Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber, and let the bride and the bride out of her closet. So lock that bride up in a closet. <laughs> that, that, that way you're sure that she'll marry you. <laughs> you said yes, get in that closet. <laughs> <laughs> verse 17 let the priests the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar let them say spare thy people O Lord and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them wherefore should they say among the people where is their God okay there's obviously more than one interpretation to the passage you can spiritualize the passage, but you can spiritualize anything in the whole Bible. And you should, to get an application for yourself. But there is a practical, a, a historical explanation for it, as well as a prophetic. He says in verse 16, to gather the people. Okay, well you can put a, a, a spiritual application on there, uh, saying it's a reference to the church. We're a gathering together. A called out assembly that's what the church means but that's stretching it <laughs> that's not what he's talking about in this passage what he's talking about is Israel the congregation that's who he means um, and then he says sanctify the congregation okay that's not something I do on Sunday morning I don't sanctify you you come in sanctified or not that's up to you and God <laughs> I can't do that uh, the local church should be an assembly of sanctified people. That's true, but rarely is it. <laughs> I mean, rarely uh, could we say we're sanctified. I mean, we should be in some degree, but there's always more that needs to be claimed. Um, the congregation, that little congregation of Israel, that phrase is used 300 times in the Bible. Uh, 46 times in Exodus, 49 times in Leviticus, 112 times in Numbers. And then it drops in volume. Of course, it's talking about Israel, the nation. That's who he's referring to. He talked about assemble the elders. Okay, in the New Testament, there are ordained overseers. There's bishops. They're not, uh, you could say elders, but that's not what he's referring to in this passage. There wasn't any church age church back then. <laughs> there was an Old Testament system in place and there were Old Testament elders. Um, <clears throat> any size congregation has got to have some helpers. I mean, that's just practical. Um, and in the Old Testament, God ordained there to be 70, 70 elders. So you figure out how many people you thought that Moses had, probably about 2 million, maybe, maybe a little less. And he had 70 helpers. I'd say that's not many. <laughs> and so that's how many deacons you need. <laughs> and uh, in the tribulation, the number is two. Moses and Elijah. Now, you can disagree with that if you want, but two witnesses, I'll say it that way. Two witnesses. Then the number changes to 144,000. And those are the leaders. Um, Spiritual application in our passage in verse 16, he says, gather the children. Now you're all sort of, you could say, because you're the sons of God, you're, you're children of the, eh, that's pushing it. I mean, you can stretch it, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about children, as in Israel, the children of God. That's why early on in the Gospels, Jesus always refers to them as He's, he talks about our God, our Father. Well, nobody was saved there. He hadn't died on the cross. So how could it be their God? Because the nation Israel had a God. And it was God Jehovah. 
the word uh, children of Israel is used 594 times in the Old Testament. I'll show you the last time it's used, Revelation 21.12. Revelation 21, 12. Here's how important, when he's talking about children, that it's a reference to Israel is. It even stretches out into the millennium and eternity. Here he's referring to New Jerusalem. And had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gate twelve angels, and names written thereon are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Not, not church age, children of Israel. This is a Jewish book. We get in as the fine print on the contract. I mean, we shouldn't be here, but it's a good thing we are, and we got the best deal out of it. He says the other thing in that passage in verse 16, he says, and the bride out of her closet. Now, we know we're the bride of Christ, but that's not the bride he's talking about. He's talking about the bride of Jehovah God, and that's Israel. It's not the church age. I don't run into a closet to hide. I don't. We're children of the day and not of the night. Okay, we should be bold. But somebody is going to have to hide that is God's bride. In the tribulation, they're going to hide at Petra. They're going to run to the closet and hide. And then when he comes back, they'll come out of that. Um, Jeremiah, look at Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. It's fairly easy, and most people realize that the church age, we're the bride of Christ, and that's easy to find in the New Testament. But most people don't realize there is a bride that started before us, Israel, in the Old Testament. And we didn't replace them. They have a different husband. Their husband is God the Father. Revelation 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. We know exactly who that is. <laughs> I, and unless you're half crazy and want to be a replacement the, theologian, you wouldn't put yourself there. We didn't come out of Egypt which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. So that's the bride that's being referred to. Uh, look at it in Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54, verse 5. This is not church age, and it's not referring to church age. It's talking to Israel as a nation. For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. <laughs> that's who their husband is. That's the one he's talking about. They're the bride that's going to be hiding in a closet. The next thing we see in verse 17, Joel 2, 17, was he said about the priest. Now, here I'm going to do something that's going to blow people's mind. <laughs> it blew my mind the first time I figured it out. Um, you could say that we're kings and priests to God, and, you know, that doesn't really apply, but you can say that. Go ahead. <laughs> it doesn't really apply. Think about it. You know all about a priest from the Old Testament. What did the Levites, the priests, do? They ministered to the heathen? No. To Israel, the children of God. Okay, if we're all priests, and we are the children of God. Who are we going to minister to? As priests. <laughs> That's not what the phrasing says. The phrasing says priest unto God. Not to man. And that only appears when you're in heaven. And I'll pull up the details on it in a minute. But spiritually, you, you'll hear a lot of people say that we're kings and priests to God. That's our eventual end. That's true. In the millennium, that's what the position will have. But right now, it's not really so. What he's referring to when he says, let the priest there, is the actual Jewish priest. Revelation chapter 1. Verse 
Revelation 1, verse 6. Okay, here's your New Testament reference to being a priest. And it's not church age. This is tribulation. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so you're a priest unto God. That's true. You do the sacrifices he requires. Right now the sacrifice he requires is a broken and contrite spirit. That's the sacrifice he wants. There's coming a day he'll want the lambs again. He'll want them to get the turtle doves and the goats and the sheep and <laughs> all that stuff they've got to sacrifice. Revelation 5. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, there again, every word is important. He could have said, has made us to be kings and priests, but he didn't say that. He said, to God, kings and priests. So the only position you are in as a priest is toward God, not toward man. Look at 1 Peter, see it again, 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1, verse 1. Now, this is one of these books that people get messed up on because it has some things that appear to be church age, but the book is not church age. The book is written to people going into the tribulation, and there's some key phrases in here you'll recognize. People do some fancy footwork to get around them and spiritualize things that shouldn't be. And I know that's safe to somebody you can't sit down and spend enough time to explain all the doctrine to then okay, spiritualize and do your fancy footwork. But we're just talking about what it says. <laughs> Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Is Peter your apostle? He's said to be the apostle to the circumcision. That's Jewish. Okay, and who, who's he addressing this book to? To the strangers scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That's Jews that are scattered, not Gentiles. Gentiles wouldn't be scattered. That's home for them. <laughs> they would just be right at home. It would be a Jew that's not at home if he's in these places. So it's directing this book to a Jewish audience. Verse 2. First word tells you where you are. Elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now... He's not saying individuals are elect. He's saying the nation is elect. And they are. You'll find that in Romans chapter 11. Still, individuals can choose to follow or to fail. That's up to them. But as a nation, there is an elect nation of Israel that God's going to bring through that tribulation and set up to rule in the millennium. Look at uh, verse 5. Ye also as lively stones are built upon a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now you can use that because he said it's all spiritualized. <laughs> he told you in the verse, I'm not talking literal. I'm talking spiritual, spiritual sacrifices. So there, that's, now you're safe. If you want to use that verse to say you're a priest, then go ahead. Verse 5. Oh, I didn't tell you. Chapter 2, verse 5. I switched chapters on you. <laughs> First Peter 2, verse 5. Now look down at verse 9. And we're still in chapter 2. <laughs> First Peter 2, 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into marvelous light. That is not church age there. That's Exodus chapter 19. I didn't put this in my notes, but we'll find it. Exodus chapter 19. Six. 
Oh, I'm in 20. No wonder it looks different. <laughs> yes. Exodus 19, 6. This is how God set up the nation of Israel. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children, that's all 12 tribes, of Israel. So they are, um, their destiny is to be a holy nation and the whole nation to be priests. But it's going to take a whole lot to get there and not until the millennium does it become fulfilled. He said back in verse 17, Joel 2.17, Joel 2, verse 17. He talks about the ministers of the Lord. Now notice the word Lord there. It's in all caps, as you would expect in the Old Testament. But there he's talking about Jehovah God, God the Father. Not Jesus Christ, God the Father. Ministers of God the Father. And that's what they were. Now if you want to make some sort of a spiritual application, we sort of are because we're spokespersons for God, but we don't speak... Um, anything they can't get on their own. We just are a repetition of what's available to everybody. <laughs> In the Old Testament, those ministers were speaking things people didn't have written down. And then it would be written when they spoke it. Um, so in a sense, we kind of are in 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Paul says this, Who then is Paul, who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. There still is not exactly like we are. The canon hadn't been completed at that point. What they were preaching was being written. In 1 Corinthians 4, 1, he says, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God, mysteries of God. So in a sense, you are a minister. Okay, we could spiritualize it. You could hold on to that loosely. But you know the literal is Old Testament, because we're in the Old Testament, and it's picturing something way out in the future, because we just saw the army that's coming down. So that's what he's referring to. Look at it in Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 6. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord, Okay, we've been through priest. We understand that part. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. So he's obviously not talking to Gentiles. You can eat your own riches. <laughs> uh, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. Jeremiah thirty-three twenty-one. Jeremiah thirty-three twenty-one. He's, God here is uh, confirming that he's going to have this nation of Israel ruling forever. Verse 21. Then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should uh, not have a son to reign upon his throne, and the Levites, the priests, my ministers. So he's saying, if you could break your covenant with the day, my covenant with the day and the night, and get rid of the sun and the moon, and not have uh, you know time, if you're powerful enough to do that, then I'll break my covenant with David and the priest that I've already ordained to rule throughout eternity. Look at it in Ezekiel, Ezekiel forty-four, Ezekiel forty-four ten. Ezekiel 44, 10. And the Levites that are gone away far from me, when Israel went astray, which went astray away from me after their idols, they shall even bear their iniquity. Tribulation, verse 11. Yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having charge of the gates of the house and ministering to the house. They shall uh, slay the burnt offerings and the sacrifice for the people and they shall stand before them to minister unto them. Now, that has two, probably more than that, at least two implications. First one is, we do know that in the tribulation they're going to be doing that. The Levites, again, are going to be offering sacrifice. 
because then the Antichrist comes in midway point through the tribulation and says, hey, we're not doing that anymore. I'm God. Come worship me. But that's in the temple. So they had resumed doing the Old Testament system. And we know that it will resume again in the millennium. Back to Joel. Joel 2, verse 18. Joel 2, 18. He says, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Look at the priority there. His land is first, people are second. <laughs> that makes you feel special, doesn't it? <laughs> this land is, and this people that he's referring to here, he's talking about the restored nation of Israel and the land being restored as well. In Deuteronomy 32, Deuteronomy 32, 43. Deuteronomy 32:43 says, "Rejoice, O you nations, with his people." So the nations ain't his people; <laughs> they're rejoicing with his people. For he will avenge the blood of his servants, and will render vengeance to his adversaries, and will be merciful unto his land, and to his people. Something special. The whole world is God's. We know that He owns it all. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof. Uh, the world and they that dwell therein. So you can't move without being his property anyway. But he's got one special spot down there. It's like you go to most people's houses, they've got a special chair. Don't sit in their special chair. <laughs> God has one. It's, it's Israel, that nation over there. Isaiah 60. Isaiah 60, verse 18. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land. We know that's not been fulfilled. <laughs> Israel is nothing but turmoil from the day they began. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders. But thou shalt call the walls salvation and the gates praise. We saw the cross reference to that in Revelation. Isaiah 60, look down at verse 21. Thy people also shall be all righteous. And we know that hadn't happened. <laughs> he's talking about the millennium. And he's talking about the nation of Israel. Something special is going to happen. Uh, let's go there real quick because I should have put this in my notes. Man, I was pretty uh, lackadaisical when I was putting this up together. <laughs> go to Romans chapter 11. Romans 11. Yeah. Romans 11. We'll ver start at verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. They're still blinded from the righteousness that is, God, that is God's righteousness available in Jesus Christ, not the works they do. Until, that is, there's a time that's going to change. Until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. That means when the church age is over. The fullness of the Gentiles. And you can figure out whatever fullness means. <laughs> Verse 26. And so, all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come uh, out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. They're getting salvation just as a blanket gift. They're not asking for it. They're not believing on it. They're getting it. If you endure to the end, you get it. Um, look at it in Daniel 9. Daniel 9.24 <clears throat> He says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, Israel, and upon the holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression. That is, tribulation has a purpose. Its purpose is for them to have been punished enough. God says, okay, we're done. We're even now. It finishes transgression. And to make an end of sins. Hmm. 
There's the time sin ends for somebody. And to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Okay, that's when he grants them salvation. And I don't know why I got off on all that. Jeremiah, <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 24. Jeremiah 24, 6. Oh, I see why I did it. Thy people shall all be righteous. Yep. That's righteousness just dumped out. That's all those passages in Psalms where he talks about um, your... It's almost like he's given them a guarantee that their seed would be righteous and saved and all that. That's in the, in the millennium and in eternity. They'll inherit from their parents salvation. Malachi, where did I tell you? Jeremiah 24. Jeremiah 24, look at verse 6. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good and will bring them again to this land. And I will build them and not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. Now that would, it doesn't mean a whole lot for us right now. But if you were living through the tribulation and you came across that verse right there, that would be your new life verse. <laughs> because he's saying one day, I promise you, it's going to be all perfect and you'll be secure. The only way they can be secure is to have salvation input in them. The way he does it is he says he takes their stony heart out and he gives them a new heart. He puts his words in their head. He implants it. So there's no need for scripture at that point. It's already in you. Uh, look at um, Malachi 3. Malachi 3 verse 12. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, an Israelite might think that now, but that's not what the verse said. <laughs> the verse says all nations will say that about you. They ain't saying that right now, and they never have. One day they will. It's got to be in the millennium. Joel, Joel chapter 2. Joel 2 verse 19. I always want to put an exclamation point behind this first word, but it's a comma. <laughs> Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. Now, that's good. In the context, we've seen there's been drought, there's been uh, famine. They haven't even had enough that they could take to the temple to offer a sacrifice. And we saw the verse that says, who knows, maybe when he's done destroying, he'll leave behind a blessing and we can offer sacrifice. Here he's confirming it, I will. Verse 20. But I will remove far off from you the northern army. Now, we've seen God's army that we're going to be in. And we've seen the Old Testament army that will be there with us. Uh, two armies. We've seen that already. But this is something entirely different because he's going to remove this one far off from Israel. Then I will, remo re then I will remove uh, far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Not wonderful things, but great as in large, bad, wicked things. That's the Antichrist and his army. Um, now, the fate of this army is to be laid out rotting and stinking. That's how God kills them. He kills them and says, I'm not even going to bother burying you. And you know he could. He could snap his fingers and they just disappear. But he's going to leave them there, just like they are. And he's going to feed the fowls of the air with them. That's what he says. Look at it in Ezekiel 39. Ezekiel 
Ezekiel 39, verse 4. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and thy bands and thy people that is with thee. I will give thee to, unto the ravens, uh, unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beast of the field to be devoured. Now that's Nebuchadnezzar's army, and in type he fulfilled that. But it's not going to be 100% fulfilled until God finishes what he says there in Joel. And that's when the Antichrist's army is destroyed. Look at it in verse, uh, drop down to verse 11. And it shall come to pass in, key phrase you always need to know, that day. That day, 99.9% .9 of the time when you see it, it's a reference to the advent or Armageddon. Come to pass in that day that I will give unto Gog. Okay, now Gog, that should sound something in your head. You know where that is. That's at the end of the tribulation, or the end of the millennium. A place there of uh, graves in Israel and uh, the valley of the passengers on the east of the sea. And it shall stop the, <laughs> and it shall stop the noses of the passengers. That is, it's going to smell so bad, they're going to have to hold their nose. The Bible's plain. You wouldn't think a religious book would have this kind of stuff in it, disgusting stuff. <laughs> that army's going to be smelling so bad, you're going to have to hold your nose. <laughs> but that's God. He's just, he's talking to us like we understand. You don't have to get some theology degree. <laughs> Verse 12. And seven months shall the house of Israel be burying of them that they may cleanse the land that's how long it's going to take them to clean up after God's destroyed this army Whew, that's a whole lot of burying verse 13 yea all the people of the land shall bury them and it shall be to them a renowned the day that I will be glorified saith the Lord God and they shall uh, sever out of uh, out men of continual employment passing through the land to bury the passengers, those that remain upon the face of the earth, to cleanse it. He's saying continual employment, that is, that's a, a guaranteed job. There's not, going, there's not going to be a need for a welfare line. If you need a job, we got one burying people. Come on, we got more work than we can handle. <laughs> um, and after seven months, they shall search. Okay, so forth, so on. You can go down through that, read the whole passage. It's all about that. This army that he's chased away, the northern army is what it's called. I like it that he called it the northern army because that starts to make sense to me. Because wasn't that the devil's whole plan to begin with? I'll exalt my throne above, 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 above. That's north. That's where he wants to go. And God says that northern army, that's how he's calling it, I'm going to destroy. Uh, look at Jeremiah 1. Nebuchadnezzar gets beat up in similar fashion. However, he doesn't get the full force of what's coming. Uh, Jeremiah 1, verse 14. Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon the inhabitants of the land. The land, of course, is talking about Israel. The north, in this case, it's Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 15. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord. So there's a coalition. He's going to gather multiple nations together. And they shall come, and they shall set everyone his throne at the entering of the gate of Jerusalem. That is, they're so cocky they're going to win, they're just going to bring their thrones down and set them right outside the gate. I can't wait till I get in and set this up. <laughs> and against the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. So it's all against Israel and a particular city in Israel, Jerusalem. That's all a picture, a foreshadowing of something that is to come. And it's Revelation 19. Revelation 19, and for time's sake, we'll pick it up, verse 18. This is when God destroys the Antichrist's army. Revelation 19, 18. He's called the birds together. 
you know, you can, I haven't seen it in a while, but the public parks people, you find these crazy people who are bird people, you know, like cat people, <laughs> bird people that love to go out there and feed the birds, and they'll throw food for them, and just swarms of birds come in and get them a free meal. That's what God's going to do one day. And the food he's going to feed them is the Antichrist's army. Look at it, verse 18, Revelation 19, 18. That ye may eat the flesh of the kings and the flesh of the captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses. They're going to be on horseback. Tanks aren't going to be any good. And of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on uh, the horse and against his army. So there's Armageddon. Um, so forth, so on. Drop down to verse 21. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. That's how he does it. That's Armageddon. He destroys them. Um, he's got a special weapon. It's the one we hold in our hand right here, the sword of the Lord. <laughs> And it comes right out of his mouth because it's his words, and he just cuts them down. Joel, Joel chapter 2. Joel 2, verse 21. This is some scary stuff we're reading. Now, for us, it's not scary because we don't have to worry about being th on the wrong side of it. <laughs> we know we're going to be on the right side of it. For Israel, it's scary. And look at the reassurance he gives them. Over and over, we see God reassuring people who will turn to him. We saw earlier, he was talking all this uh, horrible stuff, and he says, but God's gracious and slow to anger. <laughs> Look at it, he does the same thing here, verse 21. Fear not, O land, rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beast of the field, for the pasture of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Now what is um, rain? Is water that falls from the sky. That's not hard to understand, is it? <laughs> That's important. Because a lot of people will make this a spiritual application. I don't think we've got time to get into it. We'll probably pick it up there, but you can think about it. When you read Acts chapter 2, verse 38, you're going to find that they try to say, because he says, well, you had to back up Acts 2, probably about 17 right in there. He starts talking about a prophecy from Joel. And so they say, oh, okay, well, that he talked about a former and latter rain, and so that former rain must be the Holy Ghost coming down. So if you get baptized with the Holy Ghost, that's a former rain. The latter rain is another time that there's an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Okay, unless the Bible gives you a good reason to make a spiritual application, don't make a spiritual application the literal application. You can always make a spiritual application, but always also look for the literal. The literal application in this passage right here has nothing to do with the Spirit being poured out. It's rain that comes down. There's a former rain and a latter rain, and he says, I'm going to dump them both in the same month. And I don't have time to go through it. We'll, we'll, we'll pick up there next week. That's a heavy subject. Yes, it's promised. It's actually the um, for the harvest. For the harvest. Right. The yes. Rain. Yes. Literal rain. Mm -hmm. If they'll do right, he'll be sure that he sends them the former rain. That'll soften the field so they can plant. The latter rain in order to get the harvest that they need. Now, if they don't act right, then he won't send them that rain and the crops won't come through. And he's telling them that your job is going to be agriculture to feed yourself you don't have to go plant something you know like america used to do now we go do our picking at walmart <laughs> but there he's saying i control it and if you were a farmer i think farmers have um 
have a keen awareness of God. They must. Because nobody can predict how your harvest is going to turn out. And you need God to stop rain or to start rain or <laughs> all that stuff. 